the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, there's an internet meme that says, I'd like to cancel my subscription to 2021. I've tried the seven-day free trial, and I'm just not interested. I imagine after the week we've had that many of us feel that way. We were so ready to wrap up 2020, to put it as far into the rearview mirror as we could, and to put the car into drive and just put our foot on the gas. But then this week happened. This Wednesday happened. Maybe the most troubling event that I have witnessed as a, as a citizen of this country, as folks stormed the Capitol building. At least five people have lost their lives. And there was the symbolic degradation that took place as well. It was haunting, and it seared into many of our memories and will be for some time. But what do we do about it? It was the topic Thursday morning as we gathered virtually for our Bible study. What do we as Christians, what do we as the church do with this. Man, that was enough to quiet me. As I've thought about it, you know, one of the things I think we are called to do as a church is to call out sin. Certainly, our inclination is to put a big circle around those that did it. We don't know any of them personally, probably. We don't know their backstory, but we know their sin. And they certainly should be punished for it, and it is most decidedly sin what took place. But it didn't happen spontaneously. It may have been spontaneous in elements of it, but it was something that had been bubbling for some time. Some might even call it a logical consequence of previous actions. And I'm not just talking about our president's rhetoric or uh, any of the things that might have fanned those flames. I'm talking about the divisiveness that has existed in this country for far too long, that has escalated and escalated and escalated. I'm talking about the fact that we get our news from different places, that we've created silos around ourselves, that we've vilified the other, that we've elevated our truth to minimize another person's truth, that we've done a lot more talking than listening, or we've choose, chosen very selectively where we listen and where we don't. As we start doing this, we do what's much more constructive in my way of thinking. We Examine the sin that's closest to our hearts. Where has been fallen short? Where have I villainized? Where have I dismissed? Where have I failed to listen, to seek understanding? Where have I failed to see the image of God in the other? I think there's plenty of sin to go around but it's much easier to circle it around those folks that were on television acting so far outside of any bounds. But what about our own hearts? That's something we can do something about. I think the second thing we're called to do is to understand our identity. We are the body of Christ. We are Christians. And as the body of Christ, we are called bend ourselves around that image, around the teachings and example of Jesus. Jesus who hung there on the hard wood of the cross so that all might come within the reach of his saving embrace. Whose whole life was an act of reconciliation, of bringing heaven and earth, of God and humanity together. Whose love led to the ultimate reconciling act of his death on the cross. And even there, as he was ridiculed, as he was tortured, he said, Father, 
please forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. We are called to bend our lives as closely as we can to that example. We are called to understand and to live out of that baptismal call to seek and serve Christ in all people, to respect the dignity of every human being. And we start with the examples that we've been given today. The God who created the whole cosmos, the God who created heaven and earth and all things seen and unseen, who created me and you, also looked upon all creation and said, it is good. You are good. You on this side of the aisle, you are good. You on this side of the aisle, you are good. You who have committed sin, you are good. How do we see with those eyes? I look at the gospel for today. And it's a moment in history where Jerusalem, which was the center of the religious universe of the time, where people would, would pilgrimage uh, and where uh, the, the verbiage was always going up to Jerusalem because it was sort of elevated. It was the place where people communed with God. Whether you were coming from the north down or from the south up, it was up to Jerusalem. But here we have folks leaving Jerusalem going to the rural countryside to an itinerant preacher, John the Baptist. Why were they leaving? Because there was something disconnected between what was happening in Jerusalem and what people knew to be the heart of God. It may have been the center, but it was off kilter, and people wanted something that felt like the God they knew. And somehow John in his relentless pursuit of truth, in his honesty, his lack of guile, and his faithfulness represented that. And as people gathered to be washed clean of all the things that felt wrong in their lives, in their religious lives, in their personal lives, in their collective lives together, all those things that were spilling into the River Jordan that were washed off all of the people that had come there to be baptized, Jesus enters into that, and as he rises up, all of those sins, all of those deeds done and undone, all of those divides, all are dripping off of him. And in that moment, a moment where creation is altered, and the parallel between that first creation and this is intentional. A new creation is happening in this moment. The skies are torn open. A new creation is occurring as heaven is dipping down and God descends like a dove. A wrinkle in creation like we experienced at the beginning of the incarnation with that star that galvanized the wise men from far to that child. Or that ripple in creation that happens when the skies turn dark during that reconciling moment on the cross. There's a wrinkle in creation. And God's voice rings down. And as Jesus is there dripping with all of our brokenness, all of our humanity, all of our truths, God says, this is my child, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased, with whom my heart and my soul delights. Listen to him. Jesus is in the water taking on all of us because all of us need to hear that truth about ourselves. Then you are my beloved with whom I am well pleased, with whom my soul delights. Then that person who challenges you, that person who thinks so differently than you, whose truths are so different than yours that you don't understand them, you, you are my child, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased, with whom my soul delights. Listen to him. 
I wish we could see that unfolding, that moment of crystalline truth unfolding for all people, especially those who find themselves uh, from the farthest of our understanding, that we might look and see as we look at them, that moment, that ripple in creation, that God reaching down and saying of that person, you are good, more than good, you are my child, you are my beloved, you are the one in whom my soul delights. You may even hear that last part, listen to his truth, listen to his story, listen to what possessed him to do or her to do that, to feel so differently than you do. To think so differently. I think this is not the first moment in the past six months, in the past several years, where we failed to understand each other. And I think it's important for us to stand up for what we believe in. I think it's important for us to be passionate about justice and truth and the values that we hold dear. But it's critical, cross-critical, for us to be reconcilers, for us to listen to our fellow brothers and sisters, for us to see Christ in them. And the final thing that I think we're called to do and to be as church is people of hope. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that he sent his son into the world, that when his son came out of those waters of baptism, covered in all of our sin, that God reached down and said, this is my child, my beloved with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him, that that same God who so invested in us would never let us go, would never let this be the end of the story has equipped us with all that we need to be healers, to be reconcilers, to be truth-tellers, to walk away from this differently, transformed, more attuned to the divine spark in each person. Maybe in carrying that hope and committing to that mission, that ministry, that calling to be reconcilers and to be claimers of sin. Maybe in all of that, the church might be able to be a shining light, a place that begins the healing process that this country and, frankly, that this world so desperately needs. That's certainly my prayer.